you can really find out what equilibrium demand is and get back to normal. There's also, by the way, a, a really important trend, Chamath, on like, that I think is playing out and will play out for the next decade on deglobalization. So as the US tries to build its own semiconductor manufacturing capacity, as China loses key trade partners, as all of these markets stop trading with each other and start to build redundancy, there is a massive longer range economic effect of deglobalization. Globalization enables efficient pricing. It enables labor and energy and everything to be done, you know, to go to the cheapest source. That's the way globalization has benefited us. Uh, we've been able to get cheap energy and cheap labor in overseas markets to do work for us. And as a result, we've gotten access to cheap products. So when you deglobalize, you end up having to pay more for labor, more for energy. You have to build infrastructure and the price for everything goes up. We've said this on the pod for two years now. That era of cheaper, faster, better is over. And what comes with that is better national security, but the cost of that better national security is higher prices. Higher and prices, nothing, less growth. And yeah. there's nothing that we can do to avoid that. I'm not sure I agree with the less growth. I actually think that there's enough excess slack to be absorbed by all of this free money that I think you can still have sustained growth, but it will come with higher interest rates and higher inflation and higher input costs everybody will have to do their part to absorb some of this. But that's what's going to happen. And I think and we should just deal with the medicine as quickly as possible. This is why the people that, that actually think that the Fed should just be very aggressive and get this over with quickly, I suspect on the margins are right. The problem is they don't want to look at the historical artifact because the historical artifact would say, wait, I need to raise interest rates by another 250 basis points. That's just way too disruptive for what the world is ready to, to hear right now. So we're going to incrementally plot along. And I think what Friedberg says is right, which is that there's going to be a whack-a-mole that emerges. That's going to tilt the markets. Then the consumer credit thing will implode. That's going to tilt the markets. Then Jair Bolsonaro will try to take over Brazil. That'll tilt the markets. And we'll go back to this you know, inflationary, fragmented, deglobalized view of the world that just frankly takes higher interest rates to normalize. All right. And Sachs, I'll bring you on this. I mean, counter to Friedberg's point, the, the counter obviously would be hey, we, we will have less dependency on dictators like Putin, Xi Jinping, MBS, etc. And that would be great for humanity. And we'd have resiliency in our supply chain. Uh, and, you know, the West now becoming unified, say what you will about the NATO membership and the timing of it. It's probably uh, a great thing that the West is saying, hey, we're going to get together as a group, I think you would agree, and stand against dictators invading other countries. And if everybody pays their fair share to be part of NATO, well, which that's is not that's not point. what they said. That's not well, what they it said. is a fair. Point. Well, I mean, no, okay. that is not but be intellectually honest. Uh, they, every, they, we all said the first part. And which is? Every, nobody talked about that second part. And the which only is? person who you know, which is Josh Hawley, who's you know, not exactly my favorite person in the world, but maybe Sachs wants to comment, was the only one that actually said, which is probably the fair thing, which Jason, you are saying is part of the deal. It is not part of the deal. No, no, should be part of the deal. I'm saying it should be part of the deal. And for people who missed what we said there, the United States spends three and a half percent of our GDP on uh, military. Other places in NATO might be spending one or two percent, and we're trying to get them all to two percent to be a little closer to us. And then this obviously trip to Taiwan, strengthening our relationship with that country, but at what cost and why are we doing it now? Uh, all come into play here. So do you actually think that this trip to Taiwan actually strengthened our relationship with Taiwan? Did we come well, out with a deal for chips? No, did did it, it TSMC strengthen, all yes. of a sudden say? In what way? I'm curious. Well, because they are, I mean, did you not see their statements and giving Pelosi awards and they, they <laughs> Taiwan very much wants to strengthen their relationship with the West. That, that is their goal. They want to strengthen the West. They want the protection of the West. So yes, it strengthens Do you think that this our, was a hold coordinated? On, hold, on, hold on, let me finish. It does strengthen our relationship with Taiwan. The question is, does it provoke China? And was it necessary at this point in time in history when the world does feel like uh, it's a little bit of a powder keg? No, but so, so six months from now, when all the fruits and vegetables that have been embargoed and not sent to Taiwan, and then the sand that allows them to make chips continues to not flow, do you think that they'll still be positive about the trip? We'll see. I mean, I, I, let's go to Sachs. He likes to comment on these things. So, All right. Well, I want to dismantle everything you just said. I know. I, that's why I set you up for it. So on Pelosi, <laughs> I mean, look, once it came out that Pelosi was going to Taiwan and China threatened her and the U.S. saying you can't go, obviously, we couldn't back down from that because we can't let 
China dictate which of our officials can go to Taiwan. So at that point, we had to back her play. And you saw that everybody from Fox News to 25 Republican senators got on board, okay? But here's the issue. The real issue is, should she even have been going? I think this trip was self-indulgent. It was reckless. She was told by the Biden administration, don't go. This is not the right time. This is a sensitive time. The uh, the CCP's got their party conference in the next couple of months. There was no reason to basically provoke this showdown right now. And she just dismissed what the administration, with Biden and what the Pentagon told her to do because she wanted to make some sort of valedictory tour to Taiwan. So look, Nancy Pelosi does not deserve any credit for this trip. Did we have to defend her once you know, once China threatened her, yes, of course, we had to, like I said, back her play. But this was reckless and it was self-indulgent and it didn't need to happen. And, you know, it really makes you wonder who is calling the shots in this administration when Pelosi won't even respect the wishes of a president in her own party. And what is she doing going over there? She's not the secretary of state. I had the She's same questions. The president. I had the same questions. Like, why? Why now? Why not? Thomas Friedman had – well, because it's all about her making this valedictory tour before – she's going to hand over the gavel. Look, the, the Democrats are going to lose the House in November. Once she passes the gavel to a new Republican Speaker of the House, I think she'll be announcing her retirement shortly after that. So this is all part of her farewell tour. But it didn't need to happen. And the fact that she did it in violation of the wishes of a president of her own party makes you wonder – Who's calling the shots over there? And it kind of reminded me, you know, a few weeks ago, Gavin Newsom was over at the White House when Biden was over in Europe, and everyone was speculating, what's he doing over there? Is he measuring moving the in. drapes? Yeah, he's moving in. Yeah, he's measuring the drapes. <laughs> so, you know, it just goes to show, is, does this administration have control over anything, over the members of their own party? Over 60% of Democrats say they want someone different to run in 24. So, yes, there was a surface level of consensus and backing of Pelosi. But if you scratch beneath the surface, you see that the trip was unnecessary and, re and reveals a president who doesn't seem completely in control of our foreign policy. So in a statement, um, almost universally, uh, the leadership of the Republican Party said, for decades, members of the US United States Congress, including previous speakers of the House, have traveled to Taiwan. This travel is consistent with the United States one China policy to which we are committed. We are also committed now more than ever, to all elements of the Taiwan Relations Act. So one China, if you don't know, is that Taiwan and China are all part of one uh, unified uh, entity. So we're, the Republicans seem to be supporting this in a cynical way, you're saying, or it is consistent that uh, other members of the United States Congress have gone, no, including I mean, other speakers there, of the House. I think there is bipartisan support now to defend Taiwan. I actually think that yeah. that is in the cards. I think there's a very high probability that we actually end up in a war with China. Really? You think that? This century. Oh, yeah. I don't think um, so. I think Taiwan's the state. biggest flashpoint in the world. Uh, I would agree with that. But explain why you think there's going to be a war. Because I think a lot of people think there's way too much at stake here for there to be a war. So there is going to be some sort of negotiated settlement in the South China Sea. So why would you think you think there's the majority no of cases there's going to be a war? Really? You, you have to look at it, first of all, from the Chinese uh, point of view. They view Taiwan as sacred territory. And for decades now, they have said in every single meeting, diplomatic meeting with the U.S., Taiwan is always their number one issue. They are hell-bent on in recent the history, reunification yeah. of mainland China with Taiwan. And they would like to do it peacefully through coercion if they can. But I think they will do it militarily if they must. And the only question is when they feel that they will be strong enough to basically take the island by force. So that's, I think, the Chinese point of view. And I think America is increasingly committed to the defense of Taiwan. So, you know, we, we have contradictory statements on this. The, the one China policy says that we respect that there's one China, but on the other hand, the Taiwan Relations Act commits us to help in the defense of Taiwan. Yeah. So we have a contradictory policy on this, but if you really and, want and to by the way, those, as does Sachs, you would agree, China has flip-flopped on this. I mean, it's only the last hundred years that they've really considered Taiwan strategic. They didn't care about it two or three hundred years ago. They were kind of like, this is worthless. You guys do what you because want. because Taiwan, Taiwan was part of China until 1895 when Japan took it from them. Yeah. They, have they didn't been, want it at that time. That's, that's the other thing. They were like, this is worthless real estate. We don't care. No, it's that's only, not true. 
Well, Taiwan Taiwan is extremely important strategically, and if you want to understand why, I think you need to look at this map. Yes. Of, uh, no, of I, the I read up on chains. that. I think can it's we, really can we, interesting. Can we pull that up, actually. Yeah, it's a really interesting discussion because 200 years ago they didn't care, and then all of a sudden they're like, "Wait a second! If we're going to be in wars with the West and Japan's going to be a democracy, we do actually have something at stake here. We'd like that island back." <laughs> the, the island chain strategy was originally created by John Foster Dulles, this one of the uh, Secretary of State, I think, under Eisenhower, who was one of the initial architects of our containment policy against the Soviet Union, but also came with this idea of how we would contain. China in East Asia. And the basic idea is that China is surrounded by a series of island chains. The first island chain goes down from the southern tip of Japan to Okinawa to Taiwan to, I think there's some uh, islands in the South China Sea, the Spratly Islands. Uh, it's got the northwest tip of the Philippines. That's the first island chain. Second island chain goes out to Vietnam. The eastern part of the Philippines. No, Vietnam's all the way down in oh, the yeah, South okay, China yeah. Sea. I see what you're saying. Yeah, but I think the yeah. second island chain includes, you know, goes down to Indonesia. And then I think there's even a third island chain that includes Guam. Although Guam actually might be in the second, somewhere it's somewhere around there. It's a heavily fortified American base. So the idea is if you want to bottle up and contain China, you do it by controlling these island chains. And Taiwan is really the central one. It sort of divides this East China Sea, uh, where you've got South Korea and Japan from the South China Sea, where you've got Vietnam and Malaysia. If we distant between Vietnam and Japan, it's literally, if you were to draw a center line of China's coastal access, that is it. Yeah. So, so the bottom line is this. If you want to pursue a policy of containment against China, you really want to control these island chains. Another way to think about it is that these islands are unsinkable aircraft carriers. They allow America to project power 6,000 miles away into the Pacific. That's how we saw it during World War II, is we had all these island-hopping battles. And as we took these islands, they would then become a runway for the next stage of to project American power to get all the way to, to Japan. So, you know, if you believe that we're headed for, or we already are in Cold War II with China, and I think we are, I think China is really... I think we'd all agree with that. ...the geopolitical threat, not Russia. The way that you would contain China and keep them bottled up is to have these uh, islands in the American alliance. It's going to be very hard for China, which is now building a huge blue water navy, has actually more ships than the United States. It's going to be very hard for them to project their power all over the world if they are contained and bottled up and have to watch their own backs. Well, one note on the, the number the of East, ships, though, in Sachs, East Asia. is, you know, they, they have a lot of small ships. The tonnage wise, we have much more tonnage. And if you were to look, you know, even uh, the the... The perfect setup, as you explained through these islands, is very similar to NATO and the um, what's happening with Russia. You know, we have Korea, we have Japan, uh, we have Vietnam, the Philippines. We have an incredible alliance uh, in this area, a and that's a great thing for America. And, and Taiwan, obviously, is a jump ball here. Uh, but this is a setup for China, you know, having... Jason, what do you think about the repercussions of her visit? So CATL which is Tesla's biggest battery supplier, basically, you know, delayed the announcement of a, of a factory. It's not clear whether they're going to put it into the United States. They may actually pick a city in Mexico. But what the decision that was supposed to happen now has now been delayed until September or October. There's a bunch of, you know, there's all of these crazy military drills that happened. Was it all worth it? I mean, that is the question. And, and I, I'm asking why you, now? was it yeah. worth it? We don't have enough information, I think, to know what, why this was done now. It, it, was it a no, freelance opera? Hold on, hold on. He it. asked me a question. Let me finish. Is, is it a freelance, and Nancy Pelosi is completely freelance, or is there a bigger strategy here is the question. Is China weak now? Are we trying to send a message to them? A and one could equally take the side of the argument that the United States supporting Finland, uh, supporting Sweden, supporting NATO you know, supporting the Ukraine and supporting the Pacific is actually the right move here to contain the dictators. I agree, but we to, have a, yeah. I agree, but we have two people to do that. It's the president and the secretary of state. Well, that would be a, a much bigger provocation, I think is the issue. So if you sent the president, that would be a very big provocation. The Thomas Friedman article that Sachs mentions yeah. was pretty explicit that, you know, Blinken and Biden both told her, please stand down. Yeah, the NSC and the Joint Chiefs said, "Please stand down. You are way over your ski tips here." And she's. I still agree. Here. I agree. I, 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 I've been very public. What is the point of doing this now? 
is the question. And we don't have information. Once China tried to dictate to Pelosi that she couldn't go, of course, we had to back her play. But you have to be kind of a fool to fall for this in the first place. This was self-indulgent by Pelosi. She didn't need to pick this battle. The administration asked her not to. And look, let me give Biden some credit here. Biden has the right policy on Taiwan, which was stated this way. He says that we support the status quo and we are against unilateral changes to the status quo. We want the United States to be a status quo power with respect to Taiwan and force China to be the revisionist power. And we need to be very careful that we do not come across as the revisionist power. That would give China an excuse. So we want to just maintain the status quo. That should be our policy. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time on the All In Pod. Bye-bye. We'll let your way.